Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My uh, pleasure. Here in Wisconsin, I know your travels, especially within the scope of how we got to now, took you all to places all around the world, but have you been to Wisconsin before? I have been, I've been to Madison before, but it was a long time ago, and I was thinking about it as I was coming in, I can't remember why I was here the last time, what brought me here. So I believe this is my second time to, to Madison, but it's, it's a lovely day, so it's very nice to be back. So a question I wanted to ask was, after being a, a writer for so many years that pushed your work out through traditional volumes, books, and also um, you know, new multimedia places, how was the transition for you to presenting in the television media with this new series? Well, it's very, it was really interesting. Um, it's so different from, from writing a book because for most of the life of a book, uh, being a writer is about as solitary a profession as you can have. It's kind of you and your typewriter or your word processor or whatever it is. Um, books get a little bit more social near, near publication date, but for the most part it's a very you know, kind of introspective time. Uh, and, and creating a show and hosting a show is, is the exact opposite. It's this incredibly collaborative uh, process. And a lot of what I've written about, in fact, one of the big themes of how we got to now is the, the power of collaboration, the power of networks to kind of come together and share ideas and solve problems. And so it felt like actually I was finally <laughs> kind of <laughs> practicing what I had been preaching for a long time. And it was just very creative. I mean, there were very long hours. We did a lot of travel. Um, uh, you know, I'm in one way or another, either my voice or my face is in pretty much every second of the show. So um, there, there was no point where I could be like, all right, let the historians come on and answer some questions now, you know. Uh, so it was a lot of work. Um, and I was writing the book at the same time. So I would kind of shoot all day and then go back to the hotel and work on the book at night. So it was tiring. Um, but it was really rewarding. And, and the people who came together to make it are just enormously talented. So that, that was really rewarding. So you're bouncing off of, I assume a lot of this bounced off of where good ideas come from, that this is kind of a really unique concept, taking these discrete and often taken for granted innovations and diving back into their own creation, finding widely varied paths of, of creation and, and into their existence. As you set out on this project, what was your ultimate goal for viewers to take away from this show? Well, we, we wanted to uh, celebrate a, a certain kind of innovation, a certain kind of model of innovation that's a little bit different from what you normally hear. So the, the word innovation itself is a little bit of a buzzword now. And everybody talks about how can we encourage more innovation and what policies can we do as a government or in the private sector to encourage more innovation. But most of the time when we're talking about it, we're talking about you know Silicon Valley and we're talking about the new iPhone or the latest Android watch or the Kindle or something like that, or some 25-year-old who just became a billionaire because his company went public. And all that is great, and I, you know, I mean, I like gadgets as much as the next person, but there's another kind of innovation, like a kind of a deeper innovation that uh, has shaped our lives in all these ways that we never really think about. Um, there, there is a whole host of breakthrough ideas in science and in technology and in engineering that had to come together to, to create, for instance, clean drinking water, like water that you can drink from a tap that doesn't give you cholera and kill you 48 hours after you drink it. Um, that was a very complicated problem to solve. And as much as we love our iPhones, I think if we had to choose between like cholera infected water and, and an iPhone, we would, I mean, if we had to choose between clean drinking water that's free of cholera and an iPhone, I think we would choose the clean drinking water. So we wanted to make a show that would go back and look at all these different innovations from the past that are still with us, that we're still benefiting from, and celebrate that kind of breakthrough thinking. Um, and there's technology and there's computers, there's GPS in the show, and we do talk about that stuff, but it's not the, the, the kind of the normal account of innovation that you'd see out there. And hopefully it inspires people to go and solve the next generation of problems. It's not like we've solved them all. We have big problems to solve in the future. And so in doing this and framing it, you, you, you grab these six discrete areas, refrigeration, clean, light, sound, time, and sight. After pulling them all together, was there a single through line that you found that tied all of them together? Well, one, one of the big themes of the show is every time you have an innovation in, in, in one field, well, whether sometimes it's a new technology, sometimes it's a new way of measuring something. And we talk about this a lot in the time episode, which is one of my favorites. Uh, each time we get 
better at measuring time, uh, it, it sets off this very strange, unpredictable kind of chain reaction of events. Um, and an innovation in one field, an idea that someone comes up with in one field, ends up transforming things that would seem to be completely unrelated. And that's a big theme through the show. And in fact, it's a lot of the, the kind of the pleasure of the show is following these kind of strange chains of, of cause and effect. Um, and one of the earliest ones is, is Gutenberg in the, in the episode that we have on vision and glass. Um, every, everybody knows Gutenberg and the printing press changed the world, revolutions in science and theology and all these different art. Um, but one of the stories that people don't know is that when Gutenberg kind of popularized the book through the invention of the printing press, it had this interesting side effect, which is that all through Europe, as people began to read for the first time, they realized that they needed glasses. <laughs> is that just people didn't notice. They really had no occasion to sit there and read tiny little, you know, kind of shapes at this distance. And all of a sudden, all of Europe was like, I'm farsighted. This is, <laughs> this is a problem. I can't read. <laughs> and so that set off a demand for spectacles and for lens making. And it meant that suddenly Europe was awash in all this expertise in lens making, which meant that um, suddenly people started playing around with lenses and tinkering with them, which led very quickly to the invention of the telescope and to the microscope, which then triggered changes in our understanding of our role in the universe and the, the, the nature of life, down to cells and viruses and bacteria and all these other changes, indirectly came out of the book. And this bizarre kind of exposure of a weakness in the human eye that no one had noticed before, basically. So. The, the series is filled with the, these kinds of interesting, you know, kind of chains of cause and effect that I think, um, I think they're, they're, they're really fun to see. It's not your traditional history show in that sense. It's not focused so much on, you know, a great president or a great social movement um, or, a, you know, major military conflict of some kind. Um, it's taking these little ordinary objects and showing how there's a vast network of, uh, of transformation and inventiveness that came, came out of those things. So both in the show and in here just sitting across from you, you your, your passion for these ties from innovation through time just beams out of you. And, so I was, and, and it, it runs through all of your work and it has for a long time. I was curious, when did you first find yourself fascinated by the, these ideas and, and what spurred you to start digging deeper that so many of us don't think of this way? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, um, I think that, you know, the, the kind of the furthest back you can trace it is just that I was always a very um, obsessive kid. You know, I was one of those kids who would get in whatever it was, whether it was like magic tricks or, you know, um, baseball, dice baseball games or whatever I was doing at the time. I would try and, you know, I would get into something and then I would try to learn everything I could about it. Um, and, and I think, you know, as a parent now, I kind of want that in my kids, I always say, like, if I could give my kids anything, I want them to be obsessive about things and have really passionate interest in things, which is, you know, in the kind of careful what you wish for department. Like, now my kids are obsessed with, like, mega yachts. Which is like, <laughs> like, okay, you're obsessed, but that's a stupid thing to be obsessed with. But so I was like that, and, and I think that's, th that kind of curiosity is related to the show in two ways. On the one hand, a lot of the people that we celebrate in the show have that same quality, right? They, they get into something and they just kind of keep thinking about it and, and tinkering with it. And sometimes it goes on for decades before it turns into something that's really transformative. Um, but it's also what you need in order to research a show like this, right? Because you, you have to kind of follow all these different trails. So you're like, okay, Sound recording, right? What did what did you know? Sound. How did sound recording really come about? Well, they had to have the vacuum tube to amplify those sounds. And so, what did the vacuum tube really lead to? And then you say, well, gosh, you couldn't have had a mass political rally without amplification. You can't have one speaker speaking to a hundred thousand people. So, if you think about it, geez, fascism and you know the MLK "I Have a Dream" speech weirdly depended on this weird little tube that you know that sort of Lee DeForest helped invent. And so, you have to be really into following all those trails and letting your kind of curiosity take you in as many different directions. And I, for whatever reason, I've always kind of had that. So following those trails, anyone who's worked on or made television knows that y you plan as hard as you can and you always inevitably learn something you didn't expect along the way. So especially for someone who's relatively new to this, were there any surprising moments along the way that caught you like? Oh, about a th like every day. Um, what I think was coolest about it was, we, we again, because we were trying not to make this a traditional history show, 
it's very um, environmental, right? We didn't want to do historical reenactments, right? And we didn't, and we didn't want to do just kind of archival footage and stuff like that. So we, we tried to find environments where I could go. So in refrigeration, I'm in the ski slope, indoor ski slope in Dubai, in the middle of the Arabian Desert, um, talking about how insane the art of refrigeration has, has gotten over the years that we now are skiing in a desert. Um, uh, but what ended up happening is we would go on location to shoot these sequences and then inevitably we would kind of have it planned out and we're like, this is probably what Stephen should say and you know, we'd think about it and, and then we would get there and be like, wait a second, you know, well, I just noticed this really cool thing about the space and, and in Dubai we, we found that there was a door in the side of the ski slope um, and if you went through that door, you could climb all the way up to the roof and there was this little hatch in the roof and you could pop out and suddenly you're standing above Dubai and it's 110 degrees and you're in the desert. But it had this kind of Truman Show effect. So we decided while we were there to shoot initially in such a way that it was very hard to tell that we were indoors at all. So you just thought we were skiing and then all of a sudden I'm like, let's walk through this door. And you're like, wait, there's a door in the side of reality. Where is he going? And then uh, I'm in the desert. And all that stuff was stuff that we put together in you know, 24 hours there. Um, so that, that kind of improvisational quality to some of it, I think is, it, it often led to some of the best, best things in the show. And, and so we're sitting here talking you know, uh, about the lead up to how we got to now, but I know you, you're already looking forward recently launched How We Get to Next. Yeah. So as we close, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, we're, we really want this project to work on a number of levels. We, the book is coming out um, uh, in, in a week, and uh, How We Get to Next is our attempt to kind of chronicle all the stories that are comparably interesting, we think, um, that have a similar sense of problem solving and innovation in these kind of deep fields that aren't just you know gadgets but that are happening now, or that are have things that are starting to develop that we think are really gonna bear fruit in 10 years. Um, so, because the show is largely a history show. We have a, some kind of present tense things, but it's mostly about the past. And we know there's so many current things that are under development that um, are equally exciting. And, and so we created How We Get to Next um, to kind of complement what, what, what the book and the show um, tried to do with, with history.